train glutes every day. We have like a special section in a lot of the gyms that's just glute stuff. And they have heavy ankle weights and they have all sorts of stuff. They're like, you know, light years I, ahead I've of us. I've trained with some stuff. Brazilians. <laughs> yeah. With a couple of ladies that all they want to train is their ass. Yeah. So, that's it. <laughs> nothing so else like, matters. Yeah, you, she, she has some of the nicest glutes in the world and she, she's clearly she's doing some stuff every day. But here's the caveat. When I worked with her, I'm like, she's not, cr- you know, crushing PRs. She's not killing herself. She's not, like, going for, you know, it's a lot of higher reps. It's, a, like, real quality, like, you know, stuff the you, the bodybuilders would do. And so that, and, and it's funny because I, this, this made an impression on me. She's like, you know, this is my, my, I'm a f- in the fitness field and this is my body and this is my, you know, my, my meal ticket or my this is the money maker i don't want to be careless with it and so as i've become 41 years old now i'm learning that you know i don't if i i've deadlifted 620 if i never pull i always wanted 635 i thought that would be cool because it's you know it's uh what six plates and a and a 25 on each side so but yeah if i never do that's cool i'm not gonna force it (laughs) right it comes great but i'm not uh, I, I, I love being healthy and I hate him. You know, if you've been sidelined from some injuries, it's not worth it anymore. So, but that's the way she trained and it worked for her. If you were to try to do heavy squats, deadlifts and lunges like five times a week, you destroy yourself. You mm-hmm. couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. You, you cannot do that. So I know. yeah, me too. <laughs> been there. <laughs> been there. Tried it. Yeah. Been there too. Yeah. Learned the hard way. <laughs> so that's why there's the variety and we throw in. A lot of people scoff at my exercises, and they—they, they, it's such an arrogant thing. Cause go look at my, I, <clears throat> go look at his Instagram. Come on, people. I could say to the whole industry, this is going to be cocky, but whatever. Do it. I could say, all right, every strength coach in the industry, throw your before and after pictures together. Maybe there's a thousand of you, and then I'll put mine together, and mine will beat all thousand of the top. I know it would. I'm, I get five a day. So if they're trained, five before and after pictures a day on my Instagram, I, I know. Yeah, so <laughs> well I don't aware. even post a lot of them because it goes, "Please don't share this, but check this out." You know? <laughs> Can you DM me those ones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. Cur- uh, this guy's got a whole owner. library. Yeah. So I'm not saying, like, you know, I'm not saying I have the best possible way ever. It's just yeah. that you, like, that's like the people that rip on Louis Simmons. Like, come on. Yeah. Now, I agree maybe if, if you're a raw lifter, you should tinker things, but you've got to give the man some respect. Yeah. Um, uh, and I just believe people should <laughs> try to learn from other people. I learn from everyone. I learn from I learn from every coach, but I also learn from bodybuilders, powerlifters, crossfitters, Olympic weightlifters, strongmen, athletes, uh, different coaches. And I love having – that's what's nice about it in this gym. You can have people come here and learn some stuff. Like we all lifted together, I'd be like – What's this mace thing you're doing? And then I'd try it, and then if I liked it, I'd give it to clients. So yeah, what? Uh, there's a lot of CrossFitters that listen to this show. What? What do you see? Are some things that? Well, what have you learned from CrossFit? And then what do you think could be done better? Okay, so I've worked with a lot of CrossFitters who came to me, you know, wanting gl- more glutes. So here's the hard thing, because a lot of the CrossFitters are training five days a week already maybe multiple times a day so it's what do you do add more stuff in that's what's hard because i feel like the that's the i'm not one of those strength coaches like i'm a cscs and i love crossfit i hate i get embarrassed of my crowd when they you know bash crossfit i'm a, I always always like what do you think you're gonna cause it to go away <laughs> <It's here laughs> to stay. crossfit is here to stay yeah it's a sport are you going to bash – like, and, and then these the, – you're preparing people for football. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're, Which, t- you're talking about strength conditioning coaches that are, that are – There's a lot of them. Coaching pro athletes or coaching a lot Division of my one teams. Yeah. Like, they've been in strength conditioning for a long time, and and they didn't like that CrossFit was coming in and taking over. Well, uh, and, not and taking in their over, defense – growing the, as fast as In their as defense, did. the only thing they ever saw was the YouTube CrossFit fail videos. Right. That's, like, cemented in this – first generation of I made one of those videos not really not that I created it uh I was actually failing in one of them so (laughs) oh gotcha you made it in one of them (laughs) you you were failing because you were you were were doing deadlifts with like 135 and they thought that was silly I I was going really fast with gotcha you were were doing it correctly and all it actually it actually wasn't bad but 
No. It did get pointed out. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, it wasn't the continental lift one where. Oh, oh no. Yeah, that, that's good. That one went. <laughs> CrossFit <laughs> Albany. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Sorry, guys. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, CrossFit has the best. You have to look at things and go, why is. In everything, in business, in life, in fitness. You have to look at things and go, why are they so successful? And take from that the camaraderie through the roof. Mm -hmm. You you can't take, back to the videos, you can't take the videos of everyone that does it poorly and then extrapolate that to everyone that does it. You got to look at the people that are actually leading the the industry and say, what are those guys doing? Are they doing it silly or are they actually contributing and trying to make the whole industry better, which which has happened a lot over the last 10 years? Well, you look at there's such a disparity between the, the top... 3% 3% of every profession in the lower 3%. Mm. So it, this goes for personal trainers. Mm-hmm. I mean, you go to commercial gyms, and I remember uh, I like having commercial gym memberships. I, I, tr- I try to force myself to go so I can stay on top of what people are doing. Right. Even if it's cringeworthy, you got to know this. How are you going to help people if you never see it? And if you haven't trained at a commercial gym for, say, you just stick to your own little garage, and you, you go to the gym, and you're like, oh, my God, what are they doing? It's... <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I've the had form that. And uh, it, it's good to do that because we get stuck yep. in a bubble. Yep. Um, and then yeah, you go to a regular gym and you're like, oh, I should be talking about this more uh-huh. online. I should be making more posts about this because yep. people are making you know these are very common mistakes. Not just form errors, but program design errors for yeah. their goals. You're like, that's not a good movement for their goal. Um, but uh, anyway, I I I I've always liked CrossFit. I remember the first time I ever heard about it, I was in an Einstein bagels like at ASU and I hear people like these two nerdy guys talking about cleans and snatches and I'm like, those guys are Olympic <laughs> weightlifters? And I'm like, there's no way. Like, there's no way. They look so nerdy, but they're like, I'm trying to get my clean and I'm like, and I keep, and I hear the word CrossFit. And then like two weeks later, I hear the word CrossFit and I'm like, it's getting people to like free weights. Yeah, and, the number and, of people yeah. that know what a snatch and a clean and jerk is is incredible now. It's, it's not yeah. strange to go right. anywhere and see pretty good form from someone you would never expect yeah. to be able to lift weights. Like, why is that lady pulling herself under a barbell? It's just that would never happen ten years ago. Yep. Yeah, I remember. I remember the moment I learned what a snatch and clean and jerk was. It was summer of two thousand six, and I remember. And I'd been training for almost a decade at that point. And if you would have told me that there'd be a ton of people doing it, you know, five, ten years later, I'd been like, you're fucking crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so you asked what I feel could be improved upon. Yep. And it's funny because um, there's a, actually a video I saw. I think it was um, Greg Glassman was talking to like, I don't know, he was giving some speech to like, I don't know if it was some military, like Navy or something, or Army or something. But at the end of it, he's like, if there was a better way, we'd we'd incorporate it. We'd blend it in. And I'm like, I see all these glute ham raises. Glute ham raises are knee flexion. They're not much glute. I've measured the glute activity. Why would the glutes contract maximally in a glute ham raise? It's knee flexion. What do the glutes have to do? Hold the torso up? Glutes do hip extension. What are the hip extension requ- requisites of a glute? Yeah, you feel them a little bit squeezed, but it's not maximal. Yeah. Well, no one's really – well, I won't say no one, but a lot of people are just using it for sit-ups. The GHC sit-ups, right? Yeah. But, they, you know, they have the, – you have the barbells. <laughs> he's, he's like, that's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> other conversation. Don't start. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you're poking the bear. <laughs> but, uh, but, that was well, a softball, Brett. Go for it. <laughs> I'm, not go, I'm not touching that. But, uh, but uh, you, you've you got all the barbell lifts. Mm-hmm. So the good things they're doing, they're focusing on squats, deadlifts, Olympic lifts. Um, and, uh, and, and that's great. And lunges and stuff like that. There's a lot of axial loading. But I'm telling you, it's not enough. When I start working with – I've – I've probably trained 2,000 people since I was like 20 over the past 21 years. And th- it's the weirdest thing with hip thrusts. Um, a guy last night that I, tr- uh, two nights ago I trained, uh, my friend Paul Ravella, he has never done hip thrusts before. But he's tall like me and we're, some people are just well suited for hip thrusts. His very first time he got 405 for six, 405 pounds for six reps. Good form. 
and his glutes, he's feeling it in in his glutes. I've trained other people who, so this was when I was in New Zealand. There was a CrossFit gym owner, and this guy was from Zimbabwe, um, and Jack, dude, so strong. He had like a 455 squat and like a 495 deadlift. So I start him out with barbell glute bridges, and I think I'll put 135 on there. This will be easy for him. He couldn't budget. I had to go teach him body weight, and he had a lot of anterior pelvic tilt too. So I mm. teach him body weight, and he's trembling at the top as if it's like a yeah. max effort thing. So I gave him body weight glute bridges seven days a week. I just said three sets of 10. And th- these were like max effort for him. Like yeah. He'd be at the top. Right. like, And then I also gave him the rounded back back extensions. Well, his deadlift went up 60 pounds in one month from those two exercises. Because think about it. he, You know, he's so weak up at the lockout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So He fixed the deficiency. 60 pounds when you're at 500. Yeah, so it's he a big deal. hit like a like a 640 or sorry a five uh like a 555 or something like yeah. that like mm-hmm. yeah. and he loved me because <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah sure yeah he probably hadn't pr'd in two years but he had big glutes numbers like that he had big glutes right yeah. mm-hmm. so this is what it did this does not mean he had weak glutes it mean he had he probably had strong glutes in deep hip flexion and then weak glutes at end range hip mm. extension so it's kind of like range specific strength there but a lot of um a lot of CrossFitters have a lot of hyperextension related issues because of all the axial, all the Olympic lifts, all the squats, and this, especially a lot of the females. And I, uh, they'd crush my girls in squats. They'd crush my girls in all the squat variations and Olympic lifts. But my girls crush them in all the horizontal-based stuff, hip thrusts and everything. So you don't want that big of an imbalance there. You want to be do incorporating. So if CrossFit just started doing some of the, and there's so many good variations to do, but glute bridges, hip thrust, frog pumps, back extensions, they should add those in. And I feel like people would see that not just aesthetically better results because everyone likes aesthetics. For sure. <laughs> yeah. We all like being having good physiques and glutes are important, but also from a, from a functional standpoint, the glutes are, like you mentioned, they're the cor- uh, the keystone of, of the body, and I every muscle is important. I don't like to just yeah. be like unfair with the glutes, but if you look at the connections that the glutes have, I mean, not just uh, with the the femur, the sacrum, the pelvis, um, uh, the, but also the, with the fascia. They're connected with the thoracolumbar fascia, the iliotibial tract, even the pelvic floor, the deep fibers. So through through the iliotibial tract, they're connect, they, they connect to the lower limb, you know, through the thoracolumbar fascia to the upper body and through the core and everything. So it, it affects a lot of things. So just anecdotally, so many people, when they start doing, adding some of these things in, you start hearing, as a trainer, you start hearing all sorts of things like, you know, from clients. Like I'm from lower back pain improvements to hip. I don't have the hip pain anymore when I squat. I don't have lower back pain anymore. I'm hi- when I can do this hike and I don't develop low back pain like I used to mm. three fourths of the way up the up yeah. the mountain things like that I'm walking I feel like my strides are more powerful those are the things you tend to hear but the one thing I urge people not to do is like you see someone hip thrusting five six seven hundred pounds these days you don't realize that w- I started off with 185 back in the day it took me couple years to work up to 405 and then a couple more you know start out f- with body weight or light loads feel the glutes squeeze and and then build up gradually with them yeah so for someone who is attending a fitness class you know and they've just done a bunch of squats and presses maybe did a metcon do you would you say to do these exercises before or after your workout or does it matter i feel like a i wrote a blog post once like CrossFit needs a glute wad, (laughs) but if they, if they just (laughs) did like a, you know, and I I don't know if, uh, if you do it before it's going to affect your, because glute activation is popular, but glute activation is low load activation. The whole point is quality, not quantity. You could do a hundred, but you stop at 10. You're looking for quality. Yeah. You're not fatiguing yourself with this. You are fatigued. Like this is an actual workout, you know? Uh, But yeah, if they threw in some hip thrusts, but you could decrease volume of certain things and add yeah. volume in other things. Yeah. And that's well, it just sounds like you could do like activation in the, in the beginning, something easy, and on the back end. That's My clients don't even out. really do activation, though, because you're going to get it. 
in the workout. So I don't have them do all this mm. activation stuff. I have them go into deep ranges of motion for stretching because the dynamic. There's studies on this. The dynamic warm up with like lunges and things that stri- they, those act they, those get you prepared. Those improve performance, whereas the short length stuff don't. Like all the glute activation stuff doesn't increase sprinting times like lunges and stuff do because you want to str- you want to prepare the muscle for longer ranges. So I just don't do those in the warm up. But a lot of power lifters like to do that, I know, and it makes them feel better. A lot of these power lifters are warming up for 45 minutes, but I think the whole goal is to not have to <laughs> do. <laughs> Been there. Yeah, you, <laughs> not, to get your body feeling yeah, better. Sucks. But when you're so focused on squats and deads, that's a. Uh, uh, Everything's yeah. so tight. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of, you're mentioning how it can help out with aspects of, of functional fitness, so to speak. So if you're doing hip thrusts, you're working on terminal hip extension, you, you talked about how that can help with like the lockout of a deadlift. That's why that guy, one of the reasons that guy probably hit, hit a new PR. Uh, but then a second ago, you just mentioned sprinting. And so if you're running a full speed sprint, then terminal hip extension becomes really, really important. So someone that's trying to get faster, if you're a football player, or soccer player, someone that actually was going to be running full speed, I feel like hip thrusts are probably really important for those for those athletes. So that's uh, that's what kind of sparked my desire to want to get a PhD. <laughs> um, we did we did all the hip thrusts off that scorcher and the, in my gym, and I had about probably over those two years about ten different clients that would come to me. Now none of these were sprinters; they were all runners, like, and not not all competitive runners. They were like just people who would run, hmm. but they knew their times. They'd work out with me for a couple months. They wouldn't run at all. Then they'd go one weekend for a run, and they'd be like oh my god I smoked my best two mile time mm. and I haven't r- done any running and they'd go it's the hip thrust well I started every workout out with hip thrust because that was the center that was like the my gym had one and that's what made me unique um, so and that's what got me a lot of clients right off the bat I had so many clients from women would just love that and go you, you know tell their friends I remember one client got 12 people on her own to train with me so uh, I'd say, why do you think it's the hip thrust? We do everything. You know, I, we do Bulgarian split squats. We do squats, deadlifts, lunges, step-ups, Romanian deadlifts, back extensions, reverse hypers, you name it. We do all these things. Why do you think it's the hip thrust? Well, I feel my glutes working on the ground kind of like how I do with that. Yeah. So that's why I would lay at night and think like, hmm, well, what's the difference between a squat and a hip thrust? And I remember trying to explain it back in the day before I understood biomechanics. Really, they just they just have different hip extension torque angle curves. I didn't know how to say that back then, but the curves are different. You have different ranges of motion, but uh, the hip thrust is harder through more of the range of motion, especially at the top. So yes, I do believe that it transfers well to sprinting, but I also believe that the hamstrings are the most important muscle group for sprinting. There's a few studies on hip thrust right now, and it's, the research is equivocal. But this is why it's good to learn about research because you can start looking at them. My study showed uh, uh, um, acceleration improvements from hip thrusts, but not from front squats. But front squats showed vertical jump improvements, but not hip thrusts. Specificity, right? It makes sense. Two other papers were published showing heavy hip thrusts alone did not improve sprint performance. But here's what I say about um, that. Like... (coughs) I came up with this hypothesis with that scorcher, and we, you feel, if you've done both of them, you feel that yeah. way more range, way more stretch on the hamstrings, yeah. way more range of motion. But also, these protocols didn't have a tapering period. And that's what a lot of research, you look at a lot of this research, and like it doesn't mimic what we do as personal trainers. It's hard, research is hard to duplicate things. So, you know, Mike, if you're my trainer, <laughs> and you're like, okay, we're going to start giving you some exercises you're not like okay brett day one today we're gonna max out you know (laughs) and till you're grinding things out you know and then i'm gonna take your one rep max and i'm gonna take 85 percent of your one rm and i'm gonna give you five sets of five three days a week for six straight weeks then the following (laughs) monday i'm gonna retest you on some things (laughs) we think about we throw these people in and crush them yeah and I don't do that with my clients. I get the, how's this feel? Body weight. Okay, I'm going to add 65 pounds. How's that feel? Yeah. Okay, we're doing high reps, sets of this. They're never in this like stressed out like, you know, and when you go so heavy, you don't always feel the glutes working much. And you, you never got into that. I don't know. It doesn't always mimic what we do in the weight room, what we do as personal trainers. Hmm. But also you need a tapering period. 
you know, I, I, uh, if you work with Olympic athletes and you know, to peak at a certain time, you always know you have to taper. So yeah. anyway, there's so that's why you have to, you know, think about if we relied on research to tell you how to train for the CrossFit Games, what would we have? <laughs> you have to rely on anecdotes. You have to. Right. That's why talking to the coach. That's why coaches like talking to other coaches and athletes like talking to other athletes. You don't just go by research. Research is important. But I'm so sick of coaches that don't respect researchers, research and researchers that don't respect anecdotes. They're both wrong. This is, we have knowledge out there, and we can gain it. We we can gain it through a lot of ways. When you're conducting the research on, you know, a specific movement, where do you kind of draw the line on how long we're testing this? Because if I practice the hip thruster for eight weeks, three times a week, I'm going to get a lot stronger in hip thrusting just by practicing the movement versus am I really getting stronger or, or, you know, at other things? Yeah. 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 Good question. So this is always as a, as a researcher, you have to go, okay, the longer the study, the better, the more legit, right? The more valid, but you also risk dropouts. So you're like, I don't want dropouts. Like we don't have, we don't have like these nutrition studies where we have, you know, 600 subjects and strength and conditioning studies are like usually like, you know, 20 subjects, two groups of like 10 or something, you know? Right. And I wish we had more, but it's not easy. And it's, it's hard, it's hard. You know, you got to have co- strength coaches and the people that just show up at the gym training stuff. When you have cross sectional studies, like I'm going to do an EMG study. That's easy. The people come once or twice and they, you do some stuff and then they leave and you're done with collecting data. When it's a training study, they have to come for pre-testing, eight weeks of training and then maybe a week or two of post post testing. So you have dropouts and it's the worst. They'll, they'll drop out like one week before their you know, data collection. And you're like, and for some stupid reason, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the rub. You got to go. Okay. That's why I like six week studies, but it's not enough time really. Yeah, well, but here's what's crazy. So I, conducted a twin a study on identical twins for my for my phd thesis so that's cool they're identical twins that's rare to get a like a strength and conditioning study with twins right right, right. Yeah. very rare i should publish it i don't know why i have all these unpublished things i just <laughs> i want to acquire the knowledge for myself so i can be a better coach and then i i don't like the publishing route so <laughs> Uh, I don't like 42 dealing papers with it. later. It's not, yeah. it's, it's not paying enough, I guess. <laughs> well, so, well, I'm not a, I, I don't have publish or perish. I'm not a professor. I don't, I'm not yeah. a research professor. I don't have incentives saying, like, to spend yeah. that yeah. amount of time yeah. doing it. Right. So anyway, here's what was cool. This is where I was like, man, I could probably be a better personal trainer. I had the stopwatch. I did two minute rest times. Like we'd be talking in between sets 30 seconds prior. I'd be like, okay, all right, re- you get ready. 30 more seconds. Okay. 10 more seconds. Okay, go. So we did strict rest periods. I've never done that as a, and I, and then even after that, I don't. So uh, we probably do too much rambling in between sets, and too much rest time. But anyway, um, that's why I like training groups. I don't get to ramble and get sidetracked when like I do with one on one. But I also was down on my knee, ensuring parallel every rep, ensuring full lockout on the hip. So one twin did squats, one twin did hip thrusts. And uh, obviously, specificity, the, the, the squat twin gained a lot more squat strength. The hip thrust twin gained a lot more hip thrust strength. But the hip thrust twin, this is what was so cool for me. So she did her first time squatting. She did 95 pounds, but it was an ugly 95 pounds. But it satisfied the criteria. You know, you, you, when you write down the criteria, you don't say it has to look pretty. It's that they're, they have to get below depth and whatever, you know, whatever you say, how you define it. But... Her knees came in a little bit, and it was just a little wonky, you know. But she got 95 pounds. Six weeks later, she was hip thrust. And she put, and I, this was a DUP program, and I crushed them. It's funny because after the six, I think if I would have done a seventh week, they would have injured themselves. So you can push yourself really hard for six straight weeks, three times a, a, a week. So it was one day of, like, medium reps, one day of low reps, one day of high reps. And at uh, the end of the six weeks, uh, she was doing, like, she could do like a 335 pound hip thrust. So she went from 195 to 335 on her hip thrust, but she never squatted once, never did. I mean, obviously she stood up from a chair, but she never practiced the squat movement pattern. I did not have that in the warm up. I picked a, I picked just lunges. That was their only warm up. 
exercise because I didn't want to throw bridges or squats in there to um, right. to confound anything. So she had not practiced a squat movement pattern at all. Six weeks later, she does a squat and hits uh, 135 with the knees out. They didn't cave as much. It was beautiful. She like, sat back and distributed the stress well. And I remember going, holy crap, she went up 40 pounds in six weeks on her squat from not even squatting. Mm. Now I just Is she doing those hip thrusts with the band around her knees? No. No, okay. Just barbell. Okay. Right. I, I, probably even better if she had the bands around her knees. Yeah. But a recent study, the, one, the study I told, told you about that showed that it didn't transfer well to sprinting, they measured squat and hip thrust one rep max, and these were c- Japanese collegiate baseball players. They gained 36% increased strength in the hip thrust and 31 percent increased strength in the squat so i went and converted it from kilograms to pounds because we're american and need to be different so (laughs) 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 i don't i'm not good enough with kilos still we're at like registers so these college uh baseball players were squatting they were naive to the squat their one rep max was 185 and then after the six or eight weeks, whatever it was, it was 235 without ever squatting. So mm. so that's what – so then it's like, okay, so hip thrusts are probably, in the research, the best assistance lift, like that 31% transfer. Oh, yeah, I've never heard of anything being right. so beneficial. But – I mean, I imagine if I've been squatting my whole life and I, you know, I'm, I'm not – I found that my plateau. Now I throw in hip thrusts. Maybe, but here – so – Here's what I say about that. Like, these were beginners. But you cannot deny now with this research published that the hip thrust is a great uh, uh, assistance lift. But you hear power lifters, just like crossfitters, Olympic weightlifters, power lifters, strongmen time to be like a Zivikis. What's the guy's name? Uh, Z- Zadrunas. 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 He loves hip thrusts. Loves them. They're like on his million Instagram. million pounds. Right. So. <laughs> but, but, like, strongmen tend to be open-minded bodybuilders in, but the hip thrust has received a lot of criticism over the years <laughs> and uh and i've always wanted to <laughs> debate all these people like bring it let's go but i always thought that was so weird like the first time i saw it, i was like i was like oh okay yeah, that just, makes sense it's a single joint movement you're just going from from hip extension to hip flexion back to hip extension you, you're basically it's like it's like doing pull-ups and then doing bicep curls like yeah. you go squat and then you do your hip thrust it's you like it's just working that muscle group to failure you like, mentioned sprinting but olympic lifting i from coaching a ton of people in Olympic lifting, the hardest thing to get someone to do is to understand the patience to get the bar to your hip and then finish. And it seems like the perfect fit for how do we get actual hip extension into a bar and make you really strong oh, yeah. at the same time. I feel like it's a good assistance for yeah. Olympic way lifting too. But the, everyone's so traditional. And think about how many stupid fads we see. So <laughs> we're trained. <laughs> we're trained to just go stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> But the hip thrust is different. Like it really is legit. And um, but what I what I say about that is, what am I gonna do? Be like, um, come on, um, guys, like it. <laughs> well, power powerlifters, the top powerlifters in the world. Some of these guys are squatting. Um, oh, Ross squatting over a thousand pounds now. Mm-hmm. And um, God, I forget the guy's name right now. He's probably the best squatter in the world. I have the worst memory. Anyway, um, he. Like his, he just does the big three. That's all he does. He doesn't do any rows. He doesn't do, um, you know, he doesn't mm. train his back. He gets that with deadlifts, whatever. He doesn't do any other lifts. And what am I going to do? Go say, hey, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you should do hip thrusts. <laughs> Obviously, if I, I want to watch <laughs> that interaction. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about um, think about uh, like. When you're when you're squatting a thousand, like what is your warm up like? Your specific warm up, like, does he start at one thirty five for five, two twenty five for five, <laughs> three fifteen for five, four oh five for three? <laughs> you got to put hundred pound plates. Hundred yeah, pound plates. I don't know. Yeah. Does he, I think he probably makes ninety pound jumps. Two twenty five's got to be set number one. I don't know. Or whatever it is. Yeah. Frightening. Does he start off with body weight? <laughs> and how long? Then he gets to like. What is it like seven sixty five and then that's whatever. when he starts like, thinking. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> okay. right, I should probably yeah. take this. He's using, he's using yeah. fifty kilo plates. Then yeah. you're like wrapping yeah. the knees, and like the belt. You got to get psyched. Walk it out. You're like that's so specific. That's, that's, that's so hip thrusts aren't going to help him squat or deadlift more. Not necessarily. They might. I don't know. But at that point, so I can see like power powerlifting is a sport. It's a skill. You should mostly do those the specific. Deadlifts and squats and, and bench and the way that you do them in competition. 
But I know so many guys who started doing DUP, so many clients. When I got into DUP, they were injury-free up until they tried DUP. It's it's greedy. Wait, sorry, DUP, was that? Daily undulated periodization. It's like gotcha. it, it's really – there's no set, but it's like, like usually people – People tend to do it with squats. De- you could do it with leg press and chin up. So you they mainly do it with squats, deads, bench, military. Mm-hmm. And you tend to do things three times a week. You could do it just twice a week, or it could be twice every ten days. There's n- there's no set. It's a it's just a fluctuating. You know, uh, you're doing different rep set and rep schemes, alternating between higher and lower. Um, and I think a lot of the it's it's seen some success in the research, and I think a lot of it just comes from preventing boredom. Think if you did linear periodization, I'm like Anders, you're gonna do one one no month, more. you're gonna <laughs> squat three times a week for four sets of ten. Think about your like starting your fourth week of four <laughs> sets of ten three times a week. With That's five extra pounds on the bar. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> right, and then. Five then, pounds a week, no matter what. Yeah, no matter what. No matter what. what. <laughs> yeah, five pounds a week. Add five pounds of the bar each week. I think the DUP think training. Think you'll be in a year. Yeah. After a while, you end up just kind of getting into a DUP system without knowing without that someone put a name on right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Because it's not so boring. Yeah. yeah. Like, you'd be excited. Because say I said squat three times a week for this six-week block, you're doing th- four sets of ten. Then you're going to do whatever, five sets of eight, and then whatever. Uh, that's boring, but when you do it three times a week in different, like say I had you do, you know, uh, four sets of 10 one day, five sets of three one day, and yeah. two sets of 15 another day, on the five sets of three day, like, oh, this is my, my strength day. Yeah. On the four sets of 10, you know, this is my hypertrophy day or something, and then there's two sets of 15, you're like, okay, this is my whatever, my high rep, my endurance day, I'm going to, you know, whatever, I'm flushing, the whatever we think, whatever our minds. Whatever story you tell yourself. Whatever You're story. really just hitting all the <laughs> right. rep ranges and doing it with differentiating weight. <laughs> and if you are actually good at listening to your body, you would just naturally do it. Do that anyway. Yeah. Not just with the reps, but also the exercises yeah. too. Yeah. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I think I've rambled about that enough. <laughs> Um, when you sit down with a client, I mean, we, uh, we kind of, you have all of the exercise selection. What is like a loading volume for a week? Um, does it matter to you guys, girls? Does it like, how do we kind of differentiate volume? So obviously with females, I'm going to, and adding on to that, not just glute training, but how do you get the rest of your body involved in this? Yep. So with the females, what I tend to do is I just do the, what I told you about earlier with the vertical horizontal and then I throw in, in in there one upper body press and one upper body pull. Now the popular way for a lot of the strength coaches was you need to do a vertical and horizontal press and a vertical and horizontal pull. But if they're training three days a week, like doing two presses and two pulls, I don't I don't think it's not necessary. It's even can be counterproductive. Like you you know, you, you don't need to like Doing like bench press and military press on day one, and then day two doing like incline press and push ups, and then d- you can just do one press and one pull. And if you're doing like chin ups and inverted rows and things like that, you, these ladies will actually, they're used to, like, if they come from a body part split, then initially they'll be like, I'm used to doing so many more exercises. But I get them to where they can do, they're doing one chin up, and then in three months they're doing 10 chin ups. Some of my ladies do that. Not everyone, of course. That's very dependent on a lot of things, your physique and stuff. But um, their back gets more muscular from just doing one pull three or four times a week and one press, especially if you get them like push-ups for males are easy, but real strict push-ups for women is a good bench press assistance lift. You know, I remember all my, my, I had like on the glute squad, we had like six to eight ladies that trained with me twice a week and that I'm like, God, their bench press has stalled for like two straight months. No one set a PR. And I'm, and I'm, what am I doing? Okay, I'm going to switch things up. I'm going to just give them push ups, push ups and incline press that month. Maybe I didn't even say six weeks. Coming back, like two of the six girls hit PRs their first session back. But then by the end of the next month, every girl had hit PRs. So that's the whole. I love the debate about specificity versus variety, but I'm a variety guy for injury prevention and you know like not 
like the joints can handle vo- variety better than just loading one oh. pattern over and over and over. So for a longevity standpoint, but also for like mortals like us, <laughs> we tend to do better with a lot of, with more variety. But then we can get carried away with variety to where it takes you away from your goal, you yeah. know, yeah. especially if it's strength yeah. related. I, mean, I, t- I tend to think with my own programming and me and, me and Anna's train a lot these days, like I think about everything in categories. Like you, you mentioned with the glutes, there's three main categories that you're hitting. And then within those categories, you have a variety of, of, di- a variety of different exercises and methods that you can use within those very specific categories. So every workout I do, even if it's the same workout, all the exercises might be different. One day I might be doing front squats, the other day I might be doing back squats, and then the other day I might be doing, you know, bottom up front squats with chains or like I can I can do so many different exercises to get that variety where where psychologically it's it's much more entertaining for me to like to be able to not do the exact same uh, exercise that I, that I did last last time but I know that categorically I'm still hitting the the you know the same muscle groups the same movement patterns etc and I'm, I'm doing it in a comprehensive way but it's different every time quote unquote and I like that as your normal base and then if you ever needed to, like, say Andrews was like, I'm going to out bench press you six weeks from today. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> six weeks from today. I'm going on a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the calendar. Yeah. <laughs> you could say, okay, now I'm going to. I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> you heard of SARMs? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you could then say, okay. I've got six weeks. You haven't been reaping all your specificity gains. You've been doing variety. So then you could say, I'm going to do mm-hmm. bench press two or three times a week for the next six weeks. And right. and then you'd oh, have, yeah. you're always leaving a little bit of room in the tank. But if you're always, always doing pure specificity, then you're not leaving any room for those gains once the time matters. That's why, you know, powerlifters should have an off season and a competitive, you know, training yeah. portion. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think a lot of research says that just the more, the the more experienced an athlete is, variety is just better for them. When I mean, we're talking about longevity, it's like you can't just keep doing the same thing forever. I, I don't know if I've seen research on that, but I think coaches would agree. Yeah. But that's the thing about coaching. There's a difference between getting athletes good at a sport versus power. Yeah. So initially I think like the Olympic weightlifters and powerlifters made for the best coaches because they know how to coach the lifts the best, but you get carried away and you can make someone also – it's great when you work with high school kids. Uh, you know, that's why when I hear some of these track and field people, be coaches be like, weight training doesn't help. And I'm like, you freaking moron. You That is the stupidest thing I have ever heard in the history of mankind because you're only thinking about max, like, like 100 meter sprint. We're talking about sports. And you take these high school kids and they take them during an off season. They don't even do any plyos or sprints and you weight train them for three straight months. They come back. And they're jumping one or two inches higher. Their broad jump is 12 to 16 inches further. They're, they're, they shaved a point one, but And they're bigger and more muscular. Yeah. Their agility improved. Everything improved. Their rotational power improved. They're bigger, stronger, faster, more resilient. It, it, it works with everyone. And then, But then you get the coaches that are too into their uh, you know, strength sport. And that can take away. Like if... If I remember my first article that got popular, I was trying to make a big, a big entrance onto the scene. <laughs> my first article, you know, I need to be, I need to tell it how it Nine is. Nine reasons <laughs> you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I said like, you know, I I mentioned that that Usain Bolt would be faster if he did hip thrusts. <laughs> Typical cocky nice. rookie, you know, like younger coach comment. But I wanted to say to people. We've all like, been there. Yeah. <laughs> and if I would have right, trained. You noticed. If I would have trained Usain Bolt back then, I would have been like, you, I would have hammered him with too many strength exercises. He wouldn't have been as fresh for his sprinting, and he would have gotten slower. It would have taken me a while to realize, oh, crap, I'm doing this wrong. And then, you know, now I would have to. I saw your apology on T Nation. No. <laughs> <laughs> didn't work. It wasn't there. Well, so, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> it was 2009, you know. So yeah. Or, no, wait, t- yeah. But now that I'm uh, more knowledgeable yeah. and also more comfortable as a scientist and a, you don't have to know everything, you don't have to be the best at everything. If I had a, a son that was, like, world-class sprinting, I'd send him off to some of these 
my favorite track and field coach is you guys train him you know more about this than i do but i'll train your daughter to have the greatest glutes and be a bikini competitor you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you specialize they're like you stay the fuck away yeah I know. <laughs> maybe that wasn't a good um, but uh, like i <laughs> i'm excited to have this lab now because yeah. i can train some athletes now and you got to be training athletes to develop systems you know definitely and and working with uh, that population so uh, i'm excited to have this gym to be able to work with more people yeah oh. you weld that bar all by yourself which th this guy here yeah no that's a dead squat bar from uh bio test so mm. it's pretty cool the, these neurals are s very very neural but pretty this, sharp. you can rack it that's what's cool it's rackable see uh. right here so you could do like rack pull like trap bar rack pulls if you wanted wow yeah Next Actually, level. you know the movie uh, American Sniper. Okay, yeah. He's doing the, the trap bar rack pulls in the mo in the movie. Actually, he did that uh, in his training. Uh, Bradley Cooper. Um, I never Jason watched that Walsh, movie. Jason Walsh. I haven't seen the whole thing. Oh, really? I, I saw the beginning of it on an airplane, and we landed, and I haven't watched uh, the rest. The tra his trainers, Jason Walsh and then and Bruno, they were prescribing that to him. Okay. And then he, they had it in the movie. It was pretty cool. That was cool, dude. Awesome gym. Mm -hmm. If you're in San Diego, p come by the. Well, I don't know. Do you want people dropping in? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I just haven't figured out. You just don't want homeless people <laughs> dropping in. Uh. <laughs> if you have a home, you're, wel you're welcome here. Just so you just said you need to have a an address. So <laughs> <laughs> PO box does not count. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> dude, thanks for coming on the show. This is awesome. Uh, where can people find uh, your stuff and more about you? So uh, my name's Brett Contreras, but if you forget it, you can just type in the glute guy into Google and my website will come up. And then from there, my website can point you to my social media, my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and my newsletter. I never spam people. I only send it out like probably like once every six weeks these days, <laughs> but it's just like article things that I've been doing and updates right. and stuff. So that's just type in the glute guy. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, and uh, Doug and I are expanding some of the stuff that we're doing. And what do you got going on, Doug? Yeah, I'm going to start doing some seminars soon. Um, might do some seminars with Anders, actually. But uh, I've kind of gotten away from, from coaching and, and leading groups of people through fitness-type things since we've been focusing on the show for so long. But I really want to get back to that. So I'm uh, really excited to be doing some seminars uh, in 2018. So if you're interested in that, uh, I'm going to be running those through my own site, DougLarsonFitness.com. So go over there and check that out. And uh, I'll put out more information about the seminars uh, probably in the, the coming weeks or months. Dope, dope. What about you, Anders? What do you got going on? Um, come and hang out with us at Movement RX. Um, all the strength and conditioning, rehab, um, low back, shoulders, knees, and uh, strength and conditioning programs mixed with some physical therapy to get you healthy. And Anders Varner on all things social. Dope, yeah. dope. Uh, if you want to get in some weirder conversations with me, go over to thebloodsoshow.com. And we'll have a good time over there. Make sure to hit iTunes. Five-star review, positive comment, and uh, hit over to YouTube as well. Subscribe. We're always putting out some really good videos. You bet. Thanks, Brett. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the show. If you liked the show, which I know you did, please go share it on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever social media channel you happen to be loving at the moment. Pinterest? Twitter? Tumblr. Tumblr. Share it on Tumblr. Yeah. Next on Barbell Show, we talk to the founder of Thrive Market, Bernard Lovelace, and he tells us about the future of food.